Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Gabe Green. I am the Director of Artistic Development at La Jolla Playhouse, and you are here with virtual coffee at the Playhouse. I hope you have your mug. Uh, I hope that you are delightfully caffeinated and ready for a great show. We've got Christopher Ashley, our Artistic Director, interviewing two fantastic artists today. We have sound designer extraordinaire Melanie Chen Cole, who is a multiple Craig Knoll Award winner. And later in the show, he's gonna be interviewing uh, Pulitzer Prize winner and Tony Award winning author of I Am My Own Wife, Doug Wright. In the meantime though, while we wait for all of the audience members to take their seats, for the coffee to percolate, for the caffeine to take effect, we're gonna begin with a little trivia and here's how it's gonna work. Open an email, address it to subscriber at ljp.org and answer these four trivia questions correctly, send it in for your chance to win a $20 gift card to Starbucks coffee. Please send in, get this coffee card. Otherwise it goes to me, I am over caffeinated. Do not let this happen. They're great questions. We are gonna begin right now. What year did I Am My Own Wife win the Pulitzer Prize for drama? Let's see here and just look at my bookshelf. Oh. There it is, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, but in what year? Write it down, send it in, let us know, and we will move on to the second question. What is the name of the current digital wow show that you listen to while on a stroll? If you've been a frequent visitor to these coffees with the Playhouse, you know that there are, these questions are often themed. The answers may come out. Uh, in the course of interviews with the guest artists. So keep your ears open if you don't know. I should add, um, for those of you, when we do begin, um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the show. So if you have questions for um, Chris or Doug or Melanie, please enter them into the comments section. These are live. We will be keeping track and asking them on your behalf. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we will begin in a couple of minutes. We're just in the midst of a little trivia game. And here's question three. Doug Wright's Creditors is an adaptation of a play by what famous Swedish playwright? Yes, Creditors. That was a project that we commissioned Doug in in 2000. Well, I, we commissioned him, I think, in 2008. We premiered this adaptation in 2009. It's a fantastic three-hander in the Potiker Theater. What famous Swedish playwright was that play adapted from? Our final question. Oh one close to my own heart. What year did the DNA New Work series begin at La Jolla Playhouse? Yes, uh, two months ago was to have been another installment of DNA. I won't tell you which installment because then you could just subtract numbers and then you would have your answer. But think about what year the DNA New Series began. And as a reminder, once you have all of these questions answered, send it to subscriber at ljp.org be entered into an opportunity drawing for a $20 Starbucks gift card. Thank you so much. I, uh, I, I think everybody's taking their seats. Yes? Okay. Excellent. We're going to begin then, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the Managing Director of La Jolla Playhouse, Debbie Buckholtz. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Gabe. I feel like in addition to all of his other dramaturgical work and, and new play development and all of the artistic development work that he does for us, there's a, a hidden game show host in Gabe Green that uh, <laughs> that we that is just coming out in these coffee chats. <laughs> um, this is the third. I'm, I am Debbie Buckholz. I'm the managing director of the Playhouse, and it is such a pleasure to welcome all of you to this chat. And thank you, Gabe, for 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 starting it out and for creating such fantastic trivia questions. I actually know most of them, but I'm not actually positive I'm right about one of them, which makes me a little bit nervous. Um, in any event, this is a third of our coffee chats. Uh, this is the height of the summer, and usually we are in the midst of making a whole lot of live theater that we're always sharing with you. So we miss you, and we miss doing that, but we're excited to be doing this. Um, doing these, these coffee chats is sort of a new opportunity for us, and we're just pleased and happy that you are joining us. So we also appreciate everybody's ability to adapt, adapt to the, the, digital, the, oh goodness, the digital and virtual formats that we're in. Um, I'm having trouble speaking, let alone adapting. Um, and hopefully very soon, we expect that we will have some season information to share with you about the timing when we can get back in to do live theater in our theaters. Um, in the meantime, we, I think 
you know, we're doing a lot of digital without walls programming that is meant to be enjoyed and experienced in, in this digital world. And we hope that you'll join us. There's look out for a, a new piece that we will be inviting you to, and we'll talk about it a little bit more at the end. In any event, at this moment, it's a pleasure to introduce you to our amazing, outstanding, creative, and brilliant artistic director, Christopher Ashley, who actually also has a new career as a talk show host. Chris? <laughs> Debbie, thank you very much. It's a delight to be introduced by you and it's good to see you. And it's good to virtually uh, be with all of you. Um, I've missed seeing you in our in our in our theaters and in our lobbies and in our events. So it's it's good to get together here. Um, I don't have a snazzy cup like Gabe does, but I've got a takeaway uh, Starbucks coffee for this morning. Um, we have two amazing um, guests today um, joining us. Um, our first, as Gabe mentioned, is Melanie Chen Cole. We first met Melanie uh, when she was a UC San Diego uh, grad student, um, sound design. And um, all of the grad students in their roughly second year um, of schooling do a residency at the Playhouse and um, her residency was sideways. Um, since then, she has graduated. She has settled in San Diego, which we love. That's a picture from sideways. Uh, she is one of the most working designers in San Diego, numerous credits, uh, San Diego Critics Circle awards on her resume. Um, she's done several shows at the Playhouse. Um, she did at the Old Place, um, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about her her sound design and how um, that evolved today. Um, she did our pop tour. This is these are original um, plays that um, go out to area schools um, and reach tens of thousands of students a year. She did both Super Shiny Sarah and also uh, Light Years Away for our pop tour. Uh, that's a picture from uh, Light Years Away, and um, she was the designer for. Um, PDA in the 2019 WOW Festival, which took place down at Liberty Station. There's a picture from, from that. Very beautiful sound design. Uh, and currently she is um, uh, has designed for our digital WOW um, series, a piece called Walks of Life, um, which we will talk about as well. So please welcome sound designer and UC San Diego MFA alum, Melanie Chen Cole. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I am so glad you uh, you are. So uh, you were, we were just talking right before we started. You grew up in Orange County mm -hmm. uh, and um, your first interaction with us was through the residency. Could you talk a little bit about um, how the residencies work and what your experience was? Yeah, totally. Um, so as um, a student, you know, we're taught to kind of like put together a resume and put together like essentially like a sound demo reel. Um, as we come out into the real world, we'll be doing that with artistic directors, directors, um, producers and that sort of thing. So um, this was a first chance to kind of like present my work uh, to Christopher Ashley, actually. Uh, and so, you know, I'm sitting in the studio kind of talking to him about my process and then him kind of giving me feedback. And, you know, so it, it was great for, for me to have that experience. And I think through that um, you were able to kind of place me on a, a show that you felt would match in what I was aspiring to and what, um, you know, what I was able to do. Um, and so with Sideways, um, it was designed by Cricket Myers, um, who is an LA based uh, female sound designer who I um, really admire. And so um, it was really great to connect with her on, um, you know, both of us are from that Orange County LA area and also, um, you know, getting to learn about her experiences as a sound designer, as a woman. Um, and at the same time, I kind of got um, a double here because uh, Michael Roth was the composer uh, for that show. And um, basically um, I, I had done a lot of sound design and I wanted to get into composing. And so he kind of really opened my eyes to what that meant to be a composer on a show. Um, and actually um, I've kept in touch with him and both of us are in this um, sound designer association called um, Theatrical Sound Designers and Composers Association, TSDCA, um, where we kind of are, you know, talking to all sound designers across the country and new and long-standing sound designers and kind of, you know, 
I, I've made really great connections through this program um, and I was able to um, work on such a large scale um, piece. Um, so yeah, it, it was really fantastic for me, um, especially because um, of this long-term relationship that I've kept up with both of them. So yeah. Uh, I love that. And you're gonna, uh, uh, I was just reminded when we were looking at that picture of, of Sideways, one of the many points of connection between you and Doug actually, uh, who we're gonna talk to later on is you did a your residency with Sideways, which the movie of which starred Paul Giamatti and Paul and I's first project starred Paul Giamatti. So Paul Giamatti is our Kevin Bacon, Six Degrees there of Separation. Okay. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, at the old place and your design for that. So this is a show that took place in front of a house, very, um, naturalistic setup, although the kind of all, everything about that production also was lifted and theatricalized, it's like naturalism plus. Um, and I was, I, I overheard a conversation with uh, you and the director at one point talking about crickets and trying to like, they, they tried to get the right cricket for that exact place in the US and that exact time of year, because apparently crickets chirp differently in warmer weather there's cold weather and i was just that is detail oriented trying <laughs> to make sure that the crickets are time and place specific what, what was that cover i just I, tell me about crickets what else, what else what else did i know about crickets yeah totally um i think that came out um the first time i met with the director um you know he he had seen a lot of my shows where i was doing a lot of like um you know abstracted sort of things so um you know i did a lot of underscoring with music music, but not with atmosphere. So he was basically posing this challenge for me where it's like, well, the style of the play that I want to direct is very naturalistic. So how do you feel you can apply what you do, but instead of using music, how can you use naturalistic sounds? And so we had a lot of, um, I had just recently come back from a trip um, to Michigan where I was shocked at how um, the crickets sounded like they had a deeper tone and the way that um, they, it, it's a slower pace as at which they go. And I wondered, oh, was it because of the climate? Is it because that, um, you know, it, it's the, the weather there is heavier, it's humid. And so it causes them to, to cricket a little lazier or, or things like that. So I started doing more and more research about that. And, um, you know, it's this idea of like, we um, as humans, we, we live in the world and there's certain sounds that bother us or don't bother us. And I think crickets is one of those where, you know, when, when you're trying to go to bed and that's the only thing you can hear and it keeps you awake, you know? And so it's like, how do we, how do we balance all of that and mix that all in so that at certain moments we do want the audience to feel like there are crickets and other moments we kind of want it to just fade it into the background. And so what we did actually was a mixture of different crickets. Um, I think the moments where we wanted the audience audience to really notice. We used some of the more higher pitch stuff that um, those crickets live in California. Um, and so that kind of like keeps our ears kind of like, ooh, that's that's a little bit annoying that that's something we want to notice. And as we were uh, melding into the parts where we wanted it to kind of like be an underscoring for some of the dialogue, um, we used some of the deeper crickets that are found in the Midwest to the East. Um, and that's like a slower kind of tempo. And so it kind of tricks your ears to kind of like let those sounds go. So it, it was a lot of fun to do that. <laughs> I now think of you as one of the world's foremost experts in cricket sounds for the theatrical <laughs> environment. Uh, I, I, I don't think the audiences, when they come see a show at the Playhouse, realize quite how detailed some of the conversations can get. Um, let's talk a little bit about the pop tour. So you've done two shows there, and these are, these are um, um, shows which tour to area primary schools um, and run for actually several months. Um, and um, th there's a picture of, of uh, uh, one of the audiences. Um, so you've, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to do um, a show in a different space every, uh, you know, every day, and also for young audiences, many of whom it's their first experience ever seeing a play? Yeah, um, one thing that I also love uh, about the pop tour is it's um, the writer is with us for a lot of the time and that's very rare. And I feel like, um, especially because it's for younger audiences, um, you find that you have to make things, um, th 
you have to continually grab their attention and you have to make sure that there's something for them to see, hear, feel at, at all moments. At least that's how I um, kind of think about these designs. And so a lot of times the writers have already written in a lot of um, very interesting sounds. Um, specifically for Super Shiny Sarah, um, there were moments where uh, different costumes were re revealed or like we were sitting one more moment in like a Lamborghini and then the next moment we were in a pool party, that sort of idea. So it kind of allows me to like what what do these transformation mean and how can I like bring the magic a little bit like the fact that um, her dress was kind of like a rip away and basically she, one minute she was wearing a t-shirt and then the next moment it was revealed as a ball gown and so like there's all of these little um, details that I feel like you know um, with kids we, we really want to highlight those moments and show them that like wow this is something that um, somebody created and so here's some sound to kind of like bring bring that special moment out for you guys and so kind of um, you know, playing a lot with sound effects and music. Um, and so I would say for both shows, um, I tried to be super involved in the rehearsal process. So as the actors were developing their characters and developing movement, I was trying to line up sound with that. Um, and with um, uh, uh, Light Years Away, that one, um, there there was like basically um, a computer machine where like different buttons were pressed. So the director and I, we talked about how like, if she presses this button, what does it sound like? And when she presses this button, what does it sound like? So it's kind of like trying to bring, bridge the world between like technology and things that the kids see all the time um, onto the stage as well, but making it a little bit more magical. Um, so that, that was really fun to kind of um, conceptually uh, to work with. Um, on the other hand, I think that um, um, that it because we're performing in so many different spaces, um, we have to uh, leave room for flexibility. And so um, I have I get the chance to kind of train a stage manager um, to to mix the sound because they have to be aware of certain things um, in the spaces. Uh, some spaces are really tiny and some spaces are really large. And so how can um, giving them kind of tips about how to uh, make sure that the actors can be heard through the whole thing. Um, so we we experimented with foot mics and we also um, use body mics for, for the first year that I did that. So kind of like trying to find the best way to make sure that everybody is amplified. Um, I think that as the uh, stage manager travels with the show, um, it, it's over a month or two, two or three months. Um, so as they get more and more comfortable with it, I find that they um, kind of are able to um, uh, make decisions to kind of uh, bring my vision to life. So I think it's been really great to work with those stage managers so closely during the rehearsal process and then um, giving them kind of um, a freedom to kind of mix as as they need to, so. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I have to say, but whenever I get a little jaded about my job, I will go and watch uh, uh, an audience for a pop tour um, and watch those kids see their first play and just the sense of kind of complete wrapped involvement in, oh my God, I'm all of, it's using all of my imagination uh, mm -hmm. to experience this story. I, I, I love that so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you you brought along an audio clip. So this is, this is from, mm -hmm um the walks of life uh um so this is a a wow um online piece which that's a, a sound clip that an audience can can download so the the show is 30 minutes long and it's three stories and it's intended to be something they listen to as they're walking there around their neighborhood walking their dog mm -hmm. it's like a 30 minute walk um uh with uh, these stories play um mm -hmm. Uh, in your ears. So the could you want to set up the clip? What's the the clip? The thirty second clip you've got for us? Yeah. So the thirty second clip um, is the from the first episode, and um, we have a narrator that kind of brings us through these play um, on this walk and invites us on this walk um, and kind of introduces the project. And so the thirty second clip includes um, a little bit of narration from that, and also um, the transitions between the three pieces because the three plays are very different um, and. Uh, we had asked people in the community to send in sounds from their homes. So whether it's, you know, your dog barking or, um, you know, you taking a walk and you hearing something really interesting. Um, we had a list of prompts that we sent out to the community. So sounds like, um, you know, a sound that annoys you in the morning or a sound that you'll miss if you don't hear it anymore. And so things like that to get their imagination jogging. And so we got a, um, quite a lot of uh, samples sent in from the community. And basically I mixed it in into our transitions, um, this idea of uh, bringing so many stories to life. And so it's almost as if we're um, reading a book and we're flipping the pages and landing on the story we want to read. Um, so that, that 30 second uh, clip kind of 
shows that a little bit. Great. I love that this um, this pe the the whole sort of basic idea of walks of life is that you sort of a little bit have X-ray vision or or mm -hmm. are hearing and you can sort of hear inside the houses and the apartments you're passing. So why don't you go ahead and uh, roll the clip and then we'll talk about the sound design choices within it. Just take a moment to listen. Imagine what their walk of life might be like. So, are you ready? Well, I think it's like his childhood name is just lingered on. Okay, close the door. Imagine all the light. <laughs> Fantastic. So many layers there. Yeah. Uh, and so that a lot of that is is sound that people provided and found sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I love how in some ways uh, I got to peek into a, a couple of conversations that people were having and so you know, I had always promised that if there's deep, dark secrets, I'll make sure to mix it out. But um, it's it's this idea of community. And I, I feel like um, there's some, uh, uh, when the creators approach me, I, I loved the warmth of the piece, um, you know, especially in this time, there's so much hope in all of these pieces. And I, I felt really wonderful working on them. I love that. It's one of my favorite pieces. I, um, in, the, in, a, in a time when so many people are kind of stuck in their homes, um, when the first one came out, it was actually the first time uh, lots of my friends had sort of a actually gotten out of that, the house in that way for an extended period of time and to, to experience art while you're also kind of liberating yourself from your living room. <laughs> <laughs> thing. Um, well, um, Billy, we're going to bring you back a little later for some, some Q and A. I want to thank you for um, being uh, here with us today and we'll see you again in a bit. Um, and everybody on the, who's listening, um, as, uh, please do ask, ask questions of, of uh, Melanie and then uh, Doug later on, because we want to hear from you as well. So Melanie, right. thank you very See much. You in a minute. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to bring into our uh, screen, into our studio, um, one of um, the most um, uh, playhousey of playhouse artists I can imagine. Also, um, um, Doug and I have actually known each other for more than 35 years. We went to college together. Um, he is a writer for stage and film. He is currently the president of the Dramatist Guild of America. Um, he's got a Tony. He's got a Pulitzer Prize. Um, his play, I Am My Own Wife, was the very first page to stage we ever did, even before I was here. Um, it was the, the inauguration of the page to stage program. Um, Hands on a Hard Body was um, commissioned by the Playhouse, produced of the Playhouse, and then on Broadway. Um, his, uh, Gabe mentioned his play Creditors, which the adaptation was, was commissioned, uh, and then we produced it with Doug directing his own adaptation. Uh, you know him from Grey Gardens on Broadway, War Paint on Broadway, the stage version of The Little Mermaid. Um, uh, he had an extraordinary play called Quills about the Marquis de Sade that was also made into a movie that he wrote. Um, his, his achievements are legion. Please welcome to the screen, Doug Wright. Hello, Doug. Hello, I had to put on my COVID turban. My hair wasn't behaving. <laughs> my uh, mine too, but my my uh, headset is kind of hiding <laughs> a little bit of stray uh, runaway hair. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, and I'll just quickly say I'm so pleased to share the hour with Melanie, whose work it's thrilling to get to know. So that was really, really uh, delightful. I was amused by the Paul Giamatti connection. So the very first play. We acted in one play before, but the first play we ever worked on as a writer and a director uh, was in New Haven with starring Paul Giamatti. Um, we could get him back then. Now he's unavailable. He's too he's, busy. He's too famous for us right now. But um, but we were there when when he was just a, a humble uh, graduating uh, senior. It's true. Um, so uh, delighted to have you here with us. Um, you've done three projects uh, at the Playhouse and we're working on another, which we will, uh, I'll tease for later in the conversation, but but uh, we're working on a new musical as well. Um, the, uh, can you talk about just like what it's like to come repeatedly to the Playhouse? Um, you're somebody that we, that um, that we're so delighted to have every, every time back. For those of you who, uh, for the audience members who haven't ever been an artist at the Playhouse, um, what's it like? 
Oh, well, I have to say, since you've revealed our 35 year friendship, uh, I do have to confess that all of my success is due to nepotism. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that, Chris. Uh, I also will say it's invaluable for any artist to feel like they have a, a creative home and a place that will risk uh, its resources on a new work. And, and so there's a great familiarity in coming to the Playhouse that gives me a great deal of comfort because I know that the minds there are some of the most inventive and charged theatrical minds in the country and that they'll challenge my work in a way that always makes it better. And that's invaluable. And I also know there is an acute uh, and engaged audience that is going to teach me about my own playwriting as they watch the show night after night. And I know something of the work process at the Playhouse. I know the faces and the names and where the shop is. Uh, that said, you know, every new work is a journey into the unknown. So having uh, underneath you this solid core of remarkable support as you take another trip into either a distant place or an imagined world or a future moment is just invaluable. And I, I don't think without the Playhouse, I could uh, profess to have the career that I've been fortunate enough to have. It's really uh, been an indispensable part of uh, my own journey in the theater. You mentioned the audience, and I would say that the audience at the Playhouse is a big part of why I stay here. And and um, the I, I think it's we've we've lent leaned more and more into new work, and I think that is partly because we have this kind of core audience that has been with the Playhouse for years and decades. Um, they've seen a lot of new work be developed, so those kind of conversations in the in the in the aisles and in the Q and A's afterwards are really productive, respectful of of what the artist is up to. And I, I feel like those conversations end up really trying to like help the play become its best self as opposed to trying to write the play that they want to write. Um, so I, I would I would totally second that the audience is one of our greatest gifts at the at the playhouse. Um, so you ex you experienced our very first page to stage with I am my own wife and when you did the page to stage it wasn't even a full draft yet is that tr is that uh, what stage were you at that's right this was uh, during Dez's tenure at the playhouse I think it was his second tenure actually and he invited me to bring the play and I arrived with the first act and no second act and uh, Moises wasn't able to join us because he was uh, uh, doing the film version of his wonderful play the Laramie project so uh, I was both directing director and author that summer, which was a funny kind of double duty, but it was just Jefferson and I and our wonderful stage management team in rehearsal day after day, and a few uh, keen, terrific, engaged young designers from the college who were helping us. And uh, together, Jefferson and I actually forged the second act of the play as part of the page to stage process. And for the first performances, if I recall correctly, he did the first act more or less off book but every night he was bringing on new pages that constituted the second act. And the play really found its shape at La Jolla without question. Uh, and so to have that little black box theater and to have an audience that knew they were coming night after night with no notion of what they would get, they were just enthusiastic to be there and happy to watch us play. And that's what we did for a remarkable summer. And again, it allowed me to finish the text. It's for um, those of you who don't know the play, it's um, uh, exploration of this kind of uh, re remarkable Charlotte von Malsdorf, um, who lived through in East uh, in East Berlin, lived through um, the Nazi era, lived through the communist era, and it ended up running a furniture museum in East Berlin with a secret kind of uh, LGBT friendly cabaret in the basement at a time when that was not, you know, she, everybody would have been arrested and and uh, in, in big, big trouble if it had been discovered. And Doug and I were on vacation the first time we met Charlotta. Uh, we, uh, we were sort of traveling through, through Europe and uh, went to her museum for the first time. Yes, it's not widely known. I mean, the play has been around a while now, but it's not widely known that you're a huge part of its story. Uh, some of the people that uh, I met and that interacted with Charlotta and I, 
uh, wound up characters in the play. Uh, you almost were, but luckily you, you escaped it. But it is true that the very first time I ever met Charlotte von Malsdorf, you and I were guests in her museum and went down to her remarkable basement bar while she made tea for us and talked long into the night about her remarkable life story. So, uh, so you were really there from uh, the first impulse for that play all the way through to its completion. I, I tried to d dig up a picture of you and I and Charlotta. There is one picture, but I, it's back in my apartment in New York. So you just have to imagine uh, by the picture from Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson really channels her so beautifully. I, I, I think he's a kind of a genius. Um, I want to talk about um, collaborating with your spouse. So Doug's new musical, Weathermen. Um, actually, do you want to set up what Weathermen's about a little bit before we talk about uh, it? Oh, sure. In this time of sort of social unrest, my uh, husband David and I have been very compelled by some of the stories of student insurrections in the early 70s. We were both children then, and so we didn't have firsthand experience of them. But now we're finding going back to look at them extraordinarily instructive. Uh, both those uh, anti-war groups like Students for a Democratic Society that were, I think, enormously positive influences in the culture and the more vanguard, problematic, and uh, morally gray groups like the Weather Underground. So uh, we're really interested in examining how uh, uh, idealism and the dream of a better world and extremism are two sides of the same coin. It's like if, if you have an idealistic vision of the future and it's highly specific and can only be accomplished in one way, chances are it's going to morph into extremism over time. And with all the unrest we're facing now, the show just feels more and more <laughs> germane. And certainly race plays a part in it with the presence of the Black Panthers. And it's, it's a subject that uh, David and I have been passionate about for some time. Uh, his interest in it even predates mine. His parents happened to go to college and be very friendly with another couple named Bill and Emily, and they were quite the campus foursome, but their, their roads diverged upon graduation when David's parents went to Chicago so his father could get a business degree, and Bill and Emily uh, went to California, uh, founded the SLA, and kidnapped Patty Hearst. So, uh, so David's always been fascinated by these very bold, unsettling political gestures. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, and Chris, you divine something in the material and have been our fearless director in a number of workshops at the Playhouse. And again, the Playhouse has taken a really formative uh, role in helping us evolve this material. And so it's been a real honor to have David there at the Playhouse with me and collaborating on a new musical work. And I have to say, as someone who directed my very first full-length play, uh, that happens to be you, Chris Ashley, uh, it's thrilling to be back in a room with you again, knowing that uh, you hope to helm this one. It's uh, It feels so comfortable and, and so very at home and challenging at the same time. I feel the same. I, I was thinking uh, for our conversation today about uh, what it's like to work with with your to with your spouse on making a piece of art and the way that like then it's not just work time it's like the work time is 24 hours <laughs> long because you do it in the in the rehearsal and then you um are working together at home and i was struck by how many actually uh couples are making shows at the playhouse i, I think of david hein and irene sankoff who um married couple who made come from away and Mike Liu and Rahana Liu Mirza, um, who are writing a musical we have in our next uh, season, Bangin' It. Um, and the Lopez's, who wrote Up Here and also Frozen, which uh, the, they wrote the music for the, the movie of Frozen and Up Here. And the Banksons, a married couple who made a, a show we're doing, uh, we have done called 100 Days. So it's all, there's a, I don't know, there's something in the air. Uh, this is a picture from uh, 100 Days in the forum. Um, I was, I really like one of the techniques that David and Irene have for working together as a couple is they'll go home, they'll fight over the rewrite, they won't achieve agreement, but they'll bring, they'll have two drafts, his draft and her draft, and they'll arrive the next day and he will pitch her draft to me and she will pitch his. Right, so that there's never any um, sense of they're 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 each taking care of each other in the process of of describing the work, and I, that always seems to me like either good good 
writing uh, technique or good marriage technique. I don't know, <laughs> maybe both. Uh, what's it like to, to is there, is it, is it, are there particular quirks to working with your spouse? Well, I would say two things about that. And one is about uh, uh, creative concern and another is a practical concern. Uh, creatively, it uh, has a lot to do with your indispensability in our process, because if anything, David and I are too kind. He'll write a new song and I'll say, it's absolutely genius. And I'll write a, a scene and he'll say, oh, that's wonderful. And because you have a warm social relationship with both of us and because there's a lot of trust, you can actually come in the room and say, David, the song sounds great, but it's not doing anything to the plot. And you can say to me, you know, that, that scene is overwritten. It's stepping on the lyric eight different ways. And truthfully, the fact that uh, we trust you enough to listen to what you have to say and grant it enormous credibility. And also the fact that uh, uh, you don't have to come home and rest your head on the pillow with us every night means that you have license to say those things. And so without you as a core collaborator at the heart of this show, I don't think it would be as possible for us to collaborate, uh, but I think it works very, very well. And uh, then pragmatically, I would say, and this just has to do with you know the state of the American theater, uh, sometimes your most beloved projects can't always take first priority because as we all know, uh, the theater for all of its joys and all of its rewards is not highly remunerative. And uh, even when you have the very generous support of a remarkable institution like the Playhouse, uh, sometimes I, I work in film and TV a lot and that's what gets me health insurance and pays my mortgage. And so when I have those projects on deck, they have to take priority because our financial well-being and, and our health is dependent on them. So labor of love projects like Weatherman, which may mean the most to us personally, and we feel like have the most to impart to the world as, as works of theater, don't always get first place when I uh, get up in the morning to uh, start writing. And sometimes that's hard for my collaborator because he's on fire and he wants to do the work and he has you know, a terrific new idea and wants to share it with me and I'm knee deep in some screenplay so uh, I can you know, uh, fulfill uh, my WGA membership and get my pension and my health. And so I sometimes say that in spite of uh, very, very generous benefactors, sometimes the people uh, who also, in addition to those uh, individuals subsidize the American theater are the people who work in it. And that sometimes gets in the way of the work I'd most like to do, in this case, Weatherman, which again, with every passing day, it feels more relevant. Mm -hmm. So the fact I can't work on it every day and have to cut my time among different projects is at times emotionally frustrating and frustrating for my spouse. That makes sense. That was just a picture of, uh, of Weatherman in the DNA festival. Um, I do, I am very excited for people to hear David's score because I think he's a major voice as a composer and as a songwriter and just doing extraordinary work. Well, I love hearing that. And truthfully, I think it's fair to say in the last workshop, which is one of the most productive we've had, and again, all possible through Playhouse support, uh, I think I learned that David's score is a little ahead of my book. So here I am, you know, the veteran book writer, and he's new to the form as a theater writer because he's really a singer and a songwriter. I think structurally we learned that my book wasn't quite as surprising as it needs to be and was a little too narratively conventional. So it's sort of, and, and secretly I feel thrilled by that. <laughs> uh, so in a way, I'm the one that needs to sharpen my game, which uh, I wasn't expecting, but there you have it. It is interesting to see, like, when you're writing a, a piece about revolutionary characters, how much pressure that puts on your form to be unconventional and, you know, revolutionary is a strong word, but to, to, to really push the, the envelope. Um, and that's been exciting in no, the process. Yeah. Um, you also uh, are the um, head of the Dramatist Guild. Um, which uh, if that must be um, exciting and hair raising in in a world of of pandemic and anti racism, um, uh, hard to juggle with with the artistic work. What's what's that process been? What's that the experience been like? Well, it's an enormous privilege, and and the guild is a remarkable institution, and. Uh, uh, 
it's 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 been challenging during the pandemic. We have a sister organization, the Dramatists Guild Foundation, and I'm proud to say they've given out a record number of grants to playwrights to keep them solvent during this extraordinarily difficult time. And you can learn more about that if you go to Dramatists Guild Foundation. Uh, 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 dgf.org online, but they've done tremendous work. And certainly I think at the Guild, uh, I almost feel, and this is a personal admission, but I almost feel like I've uh, 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 outlived my welcome in a way, because you look at the past presidents of the Guild and you see a, a gallery of exciting theater artists, Stephen Sondheim and John Weidman and Stephen Schwartz, and uh, all the way back to George Kaufman, but we all have one thing in common, and that's that we're all white men of a certain age. And I do think the culture is really demanding of us in a very new and, and very uh, urgent way to really examine ways in which we uh, inadvertently or deliberately uphold systemic racism. And I think that uh, ensuring that the Guild uh, becomes as diverse in its leadership as it is in its membership, and that it represents all the voices writing for the American theater, not just a privileged few, is really a mandate in the culture right now and a very welcome one. And so uh, we're doing a lot of anti-racism work at the Guild, and if anything, it's sort of become our institutional priority, and I think that's true of many organizations. And so uh, I, I hope that I am working steadily toward my own obsolescence at the Guild. Yeah, no, I would definitely second that. I mean, I, I, I think I have my toe in a variety of different organizations, and certainly at the Playhouse, the, the the question uh, of uh, how do we create a less racist future for you know our the the plays we make the 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 profession we're in and our society um, is in every conversation uh, and it's 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 um, it's a huge commitment that I think the Playhouse is taking on that the field is taking on certainly I serve on the board of SDC the directors um, uh, and choreographers. Um, union as well, and it's a huge conversation there. And every play that um, is, has is has been running, um, there's five companies have come from away, and every one has had a kind of company meeting to kind of talk about how has race played in the process of making that out and that process of making that show. Um, are there things that haven't been said that need to be said to each other? Um, and you know, I think all of those conversations assume goodwill on the part of all the participants, which is very important, but also are willing to unearth the difficult stuff that often has not been talked about, but needs to be. So it's a transformative moment and it's, you know, it's, um, goodness knows it's not easy. I mean, it's incredibly just um, uh, difficult conversation so much of the time, but it's happening in every organization I know and it's important that it, do, that it does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, I feel like we're sort of at a moment we could uh, shift over to some Q and A. So maybe bring um, Melanie uh, back to uh, to our screen. And uh, hey, Melanie, welcome back. Hi. Hey, Melanie. Hey. Uh, and uh, Gabe's come back. Good. And uh, Gabe, will you sort of moderate and field uh, questions for us? I will. As always, a, a couple of uh, very eager subscribers have emailed questions ahead of time. But first, uh, Stephen Nagler has very patiently been waiting for answers to his questions. Uh, first, you mentioned, Doug and Chris, that you met uh, as undergraduates. What? Where was that? Uh, it, there was a production of, wow, I, I'm actually superstitious about this. I'm not going to, do you going to say, are you going to say the name of the play? Well, okay, I'm not either. It's the, it's, the, it's the Shakespeare play, the Scottish play. It's often called Mackers. We were doing a production of that where uh, we were both acting in. Um, and it was in fact kind of cursed, which is the super, super <laughs> cursed play. The more more terrible things happen on that production than I can count. Everyone was sick and had uh, broken bones and all the lighting and sound equipment was stolen at one point and the set kind of like it, it broke routinely, <laughs> like with people on it. It was it was an awful experience, but it was wonderful <laughs> to be done. Um, and, uh, and then Yale, that's sort of a thing that there's, there's theater to every nook and cranny. And this was in a, a squash court in the basement of uh, Branford. No, it wasn't Branford. I forget what college uh, within Yale. Davenport. Davenport, well said. 
Yes. So there you go, Stephen. It was Yale. Yeah, Stephen was actually asking what. what it was what a simpler question than I answered. Yale. <laughs> <laughs> but also, no. uh, Stephen also uh, was curious. I mean, there was the story about meeting Charlotta, uh, the, the two of you. Doug, was that the first time that you had met her? Um, and from that first meeting, how long until the page to stage uh, at La Jolla Playhouse? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. That was absolutely the first time I met her. Uh, Chris and I, in our long history of uh, friendship, uh, we have traveled on occasion several times together and, and had remarkable trips. And that was one when we uh, just decided we wanted to hit Europe. And so we were in Berlin and staying with a friend who knew Charlotta and took us uh, for our first meeting. And I then, about six months later, asked if I could return to research her life and begin working on the play. And then I feel like it was almost 10 years before the page to stage because the play took a long time to evolve. So it was a, a labor of love for a very long time. I love that in the, in the development of that play, you sort of thought the story was one thing until at one point about midway through that 10 years, you got her Stasi file and discovered there was a whole other story that was that lived underneath the first story you were trying to tell. I, the, I love the way the world sometimes changes the direction of a play. Yeah, it, it was fascinating because her life was unfolding in real time while I was researching it. So I'd stumble on new and remarkable discoveries and then have to integrate them into the text. And that happened again and again and again with that play. Thank you. Melanie, we had a question in advance for you, uh, which was how did you first get uh, interested in sound design and what made you want to pursue it as a career? Um, I actually, I, I did go to grad school at UCSD, but I also did go to undergrad at UCSD, but I was not in the theater department. Um, I started out being a biology major, but I've played piano all my life. So um, at some point I, I wanted to make a big shift because I, I was not interested um, in, in working in a lab or being a doctor um, at that point. Um, and so it was my third year in college, actually, I took an um, intro to design class um, at UCSD. And um, I, I think at that point, I, I started shifting my major to music. And at, at UCSD, there's a special major called interdisciplinary computing and the arts, which means um, anything computers and anything arts. And so I took a wide variety of classes where, you know, I learned how to mix a CD. I learned how to use microphones. I also learned how to make sound art and, you know, so things like that. And I, I felt like um, I, I wanted something more tangible. And, and so I actually um, basically knocked on the door of the sound shop and was all like, hi, I don't know anything about the theater, but I hear that this could potentially be interesting. And um, that's, I, I actually interned um, at the sound shop when I was an undergrad, that was part of my um, work study package as, as an undergrad. And basically um, through that, I did a lot of the UCSD productions and I kind of fell in love with it. And um, I think after I graduated with my music degree, I, I was like, how, how can I make this into a career? And so I think the La Jolla Playhouse actually hired me on my first, um, what show was it? It was um, Sleeping Beauty Wakes. I was the A2 uh, for Leon Rothenberg. And basically it, it was a great time to kind of like meet with him on and learn about his career. Um, and basically that's kind of where I was like, I want to do this. And then I applied for grad school and kind of got the ball rolling in that way. So, yeah. Just to get that for the audience, A2. So on a musical, A, the audio one is the person who mixes it. Audio two is the person who's actually getting the mics on the, the actors and uh, changing batteries and, and yeah. making sure that the, the, the tech of it all backstage works. And following up on that, Melanie, I see a, another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Is your preference to design realistic or abstract audio? That that's a good question. I think throughout, I, I've I think it depends on the play. Actually, um, I, I think that there's certain plays that are written that are. Um, ask for abstraction. And I think um, depending on um, what the director is looking for, um, I think I find to, uh, I find that I'm going one way or the other. I think I find uh, doing realistic plays hard, um, harder to do just because um, all of us come in with preconceived notions of what something is sounding like. So my, my example that I always give is um, I, I once did a show where some of the scenes took place in a car. And so the director was like, well, we need to make it sound like we're in a car. 
And so, um, you know, I did some research. I, I drove my car around. I made a right turn, made a left turn to see if there were different sounds. But, you know, actually cars nowadays don't really have a sound when you're sitting inside of them. And so it's this idea of like how much reality is real in the theater versus how much I have to um, you know, stretch the truth a little bit. And it's that whole story where um, the American Eagle sound is actually not a sound of an eagle screeching, but it's of a, a red tailed hawk, just because we like that sound better than the way we like a bald eagle screeching. So th things like that, where our conception of sound um, is shaped by our world. And so I have to take those into consideration when I'm doing something more naturalistic and abstraction, I can just have fun and do my imagination, so yeah. I would just I would second that. I, I feel like a lot of the sound designers I work with, if we're looking for a sound effect, you know, that kind of grounds something in the natural, often I will they'll play for me twenty different sounds, and only one of them will be re realish, right? Like actually a appropriate the real thing, and and that turns out to almost never be the one you pick. Right? <laughs> like it's about the feeling of the sound yeah. is what is what leads you, not the actualness of the sound. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Doug, another question came in earlier. You were talking in your interview about the wide variety of projects that you do, both in theater, plays, and musicals, as well as the TV and film world. Uh, so this was a question about the differences in that. Uh, what are the differences in your approaches to plays versus musicals, and uh, the differences in the relative joys and challenges about theater versus TV and film? Oh, that's such a good question. And I think uh, one of them actually has to do with the Dramatists Guild. And that's that uh, when the Guild was founded in the 1920s, writers like George Kaufman and Moss Hart and Eugene O'Neill got together and said, what do we value most in our profession? Copyright. We want to retain the copyright to everything that we produce so that we will have jurisdiction over it uh, for the rest of time. We will own what we write and we can mandate the terms under which it's produced. Uh, so we, uh, as a result, earn a lot less money in the theater and the Dramatist Guild is not a union, it's a trade association because we are not employees for hire who are eligible for union membership. We are owners of property that we lease to producers who present it and pay us. So we don't have pension, we don't have health care. We gave up those things because we believe that our authorial voice is as uh, uh, original as our DNA strand, and we want to call it our own. Now, screenwriters made a different decision. They said, we want pension, we want healthcare, we'll be employees for hire, and the studios can own the copyright on everything we write. So as a result, uh, any studio can replace you at a moment's notice. Actors rewrite scenes on set all the time, and you as an author have no control over the eventual evolution of the material. Now, that said, there are monetary rewards, and that degree of collaboration can yield its own aesthetic gratification as well, but it's a very different kind of gratification. So I can honestly say, if I weren't a playwright, I'm not sure I could call myself an author in the truest way, because the theater still honors authorship by granting the people who create the work the rights to the work. That's not true in TV and film. So. Uh, I would say how that translates into a difference in process. Uh, basically, I've made it a habit. If I have an original idea, I write a play. And if a studio wants me to adapt a book or an article or a real life event, I say yes, uh, because I know I won't own the copyright. So if it's based on underlying material, it's not born of my soul in the same way that a play is. So really when it comes to uh, uh, TV and film, I'll really only do adaptations. But as a dramatist, I love doing original work. Wonderful. Chris, one last question uh, as we near the end of our time. So uh, aside from meeting artists in productions of the Scottish play at Yale, how do you, uh, how do you find and cultivate the artists that you want to work with? What, what is your methodology for finding exciting artists? Um, gosh, it is so eclectic. I think methodology is too strong a word. It, <laughs> I, uh, uh, agents send us uh, uh, scripts, authors, directors, actors that we love send us scripts that they're interested in working on. Um, 
uh, audience members suggest, oh, I saw this uh, play, you should check out this writer, and then you check out the writer and see what their next play um, is. Um, uh, there'll be a seed of an idea that's that bubbles up out of the artistic department or that an artist mentions in passing in another project that you then commission and grow into its, its own full um, show. Um, there's infinite number of doors that you can walk through um, into um, full production at, uh, at the Playhouse. And, and it, one of the joys and frustrations um, um, of new work at the Playhouse is we're always developing many more shows than we could actually produce. Um, right through DNA, through page to stage, through commissioning and, and workshop uh, projects. Um, but the the joy of that is there's there's room for new relate that we're constantly in the business of cultivating new relationships of like oh that, that, that I loved that play hey let's let's start a conversation and let's start working together um, and there's I think it's a very um, golden moment actually for writing in the American theater there's so many really particular interesting voices with urgent stories to tell that's a very very exciting time um, to have some stages and be able to invite um, exciting artists onto onto those stages so uh, I didn't there's actually not an answer to that question because it really is different every time um, but it always leads with does that does it seem like that artist has a um, a story that is important for them to tell um, and that seems like it needs to be told now. Well put. Um, everybody, thank you so much. Melanie, Doug, Chris, uh, we appreciate you taking some time out of your Friday morning as, uh, as we do for all of you at home. And to, uh, to gracefully take us to our close, we welcome back Debbie Buckholtz. Hey, Debbie. Thank you to Doug and Melanie so much. Okay, graceful is overstating it, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much to Doug and Melanie. I've now known Doug not nearly as long as Chris has, but for the 18 years that I've been at the Playhouse. And first of all, I love the cap. That is a, a definite <laughs> And every time there's a conversation, I just learn so much and enjoy it so much. And it just, it deepens and kind of richens my appreciation, you know, for the, for the fact that I get to work in theater. And so thank you. And Melanie is a fellow UCSD grad and alum it's so nice to to get to know you better as well so thank you to and chris and gabe i know you guys well anyhow so thank you for doing it this morning but you know <laughs> but thank you to all of you for joining us i i think um just listening to what chris said about the 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 multitude of voices who are creating theater right now we we can't wait to get back to producing live theater with all of you running into you in our in our hallways and in our lobbies and getting a chance to talk with you before and after our shows um so we are working towards that we are excited to share mornings like this with you um, excited to share our digital wow programming with you actually please be on the lookout you're going to be getting an exclusive subscriber only invitation to a new Playhouse commissioned WOW project. Um, it's called the Homebound Travelogue. Excuse me, Homebound Travelogue. There we go, can't speak this morning. Maybe not enough coffee. Um, thank you very much. Oh, called, there we go. You are here, the Homebound Travelogue, in case I can't read. Um, in any event, thank you. I hope that you will join us and um, and be well and be safe and and we will see you very soon and if not if not before at our very next coffee chat which is just a few weeks away so thank you anything else you want to say chris no i want to say thank you all for for your support of the playhouse and your love of theater absolutely good morning everybody and have a great weekend <laughs>